All right, welcome to our next class on CSC 103. Last week we talked a little bit about uh, communism and how its influence uh, is dependent on the evolution philosophy. Now we're going to continue. We left off talking a little bit about the, the money and how money is controlled. And we have, uh, totally unknowingly to most people, we have, we've lost all of our money. We're carrying around paper and we all think we still have money. And we have been totally, completely robbed and don't even know it. It's absolutely masterful the way they did this by taking away the money and giving us paper. And this was all done. You can, if you missed that, watch the last class. But uh, the, the Constitution uh, is, or the government's very clear that money is a certain number of grams of gold, gold or silver, real money. Well, we don't get that anymore. We get paper notes. If I said, Steve, I'll buy your truck. I'm going to give you an IOU for $8,000. I give you the IOU and you give me the truck and you walk around thinking, man, I've got $8,000. No, you have an IOU for $8,000, right? And all of the Federal Reserve notes that we have are IOUs. They are not money. But boy, have we been duped into that one. Okay. Mondex is a corporation that is probably going to be one of the, <coughs> one of the key players in um, the end times here toward the mark of the beast. Uh, monetary and Dexter, this is what it is, it's a combination of these two words, it's how they chose the name Mondex for their corporation. Webster's Dictionary uh, defines monetary as pertaining to money and Dexter as belonging to or located on the right hand. If someone is ambidextrous, what does that mean? They can use both hands, right? Dexter has relating to the hand. The word ambidextrous means able to use both hands, and dexter means pertaining to the right hand. So MasterCard has 51% ownership of Mondex. Of course, MasterCard is uh, one of the biggest you know, credit card companies there is. Now think about how the sequence here. You go to the store, you buy something from the store, they scan it over the scanner. It's all done electronically. Then they swipe your MasterCard. A phone call is made. Does this guy really have money? Comes back, yeah, he's fine. Go ahead, accept it. And the store must pay somewhere between 2 and 4% to MasterCard of the purchase. If you buy something for 100 bucks, MasterCard makes either 2 3 or $4, depending on what arrangement they have set up. And they didn't do anything except guarantee that the card was good. And they have pretty high fraud rate. Uh, which I'm sure some of their interest, uh, that plus the person's going to pay interest on that card. So not only is it the interest you pay on your MasterCard, every time you purchase, the, the store must pay three or four, two or three or four or five percent to MasterCard just for the privilege of letting you do that. That gets to be an awful lot of money if you buy something. We bought a car once, uh, not a new car, we bought a used car for my wife on a, on a credit card. And, you know, the MasterCard made a fortune off of that, 2 or 3%. I think it was like $9,000, you know, for this, for this used car, or $10,000. And uh, it amounts to a few dollars. It's just one transaction. So the same phone call. It didn't cost them much of anything. Uh, one of the uh, leaders, Robin Kelly, said, this is the final stage in becoming a global reality said Robin Kelly of Mondex International. With MasterCard's backing, there's nothing to stop Mondex now from becoming the global standard. You need to keep an eye open for smart cards. They are coming next. You guys in the military already have a mark card, which has an enormous amount of information in there. It's a little computer circuit built right into a card. You got yours with you? You got to have it with you, right? Steve, you got yours? That little mark card. The next step is very simple. It becomes a little microchip and it's injected in the right hand. I met last night, I was in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I met with, uh, well, this morning I was in Little Rock, but I met with Carl Sanders. Carl Sanders has been a friend of mine for years. He is one of the guys who helped invent the little microchip. And he travels all over and speaks on this topic. He's a Christian and shows people, look folks, we are very close to the coming of the Lord. You know, 20 years ago, the prophecy that everybody would receive a mark in their hand or in their forehead before you could buy or sell, 20 years ago, that, that was a... People laughed at that prophecy. Yeah, right. How are you going to get a mark to buy or sell? And Carl Sanders has a lot of information how the, the, the Greek word uh, for mark is etching. And microchips are etched in the silicone. And he goes through a whole series of how it fits exactly what the book of Revelation says is going to happen. Some type of little chip is probably gets what's going to 
be the mark of the beast. And it's going to be in the right hand or the forehead. Anyway, smart cards are here. Set technology means a secure electronic transaction. Everybody that uses their credit card, of course, wants to make sure, is this secure? Are you going to give my credit card number to other people so they can charge stuff? You know, it's assumed that the card is secure. It's called set technology. It's interesting they chose that name because Set is the Egyptian god of evil or Satan. It's just a coincidence, I'm sure, but AT&T uh, Lucent Technologies purchased the franchise from Mondex USA. Their logo is the symbol of the solar serpent, <clears throat> the red dragon, which is Lucifer. How many have ever seen Lucent Technologies' red circle? You see it all over the place on telephones. I mean, there's a huge corporation. Uh, Lucent is composed from Lucifer and Enterprises. They seem to be quite flagrant in naming their products. Styx is the name of one of their products, which is a river in Hades, according to the Satan worshippers. Janus, that's the two-faced god. You can get that, use Janus, I believe, to order stocks or bonds or something like that. You ever heard of Janus? That's <laughs> the two-faced god. It's, uh, it's, now, may, I'm not saying everybody involved in this is evil. Half the folks probably don't even know. But Satan does have plans for a one-world government. And it's, you have to control the money. People will not be able to buy or sell without their authority. Right now, if you did not have any cash and you didn't have a checkbook and you went to the store to buy something, what would they do? They would not let you buy it, right? It's just going to be very simple. I don't think there's going to be a big thing where Christians get to stand up and say, I'm refusing to take this mark, you know, here, chop my head off. It, it just won't be an opportunity like that. I think it'll just be a quiet gradual choking of the system where if you don't have this mark, you just simply don't buy. No stores will take cash anymore. No stores will take credit cards. Anyway, this is the things I've been told about uh, some of this, so you can read it for yourself and check it out if you like. There's uh, email and website to get information. But Lucent Technologies is uh, naming their products like Sticks and uh, Janus Inferno, promoted with a quote from the Inferno. Um, a story about Lucifer in the bowels of hell. This company deliberately chose to move their new offices into 666 Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. That's what I was told, and I saw the picture of the building, 666 on the building. Now, whether they moved since then or not, I don't know, but that was, uh, somebody sent me a video about that. There's a lot of information going around. Okay, Karl Marx's next plank in the Communist Manifesto. We've been going through his 10 planks in the Communist Manifesto. Number six was government ownership of communication and transportation. Right now, the government owns just about every car in the United States. You probably think that you own a car, but you don't. When the car was manufactured, a certificate of, uh, I think they call it a certificate of manufacture, was created. Uh, it was sent to the, the car, when the car entered the state of Florida, the um, state of Florida kept the certificate of, a uh, certificate of origination is what it's called. They issue a certificate of title. You then, when you bought the car, they gave you a certificate of title. Now, if you buy a brand new car, only if you buy a new car, and only if you pay for it with silver or gold, then you can demand that you get the certificate of origination. Now you really own the car. You don't have to buy license plates. You don't have to, because really, buying a license plate is renting the car off of the state for, for, for a year. And in some states, the license plates are incredibly expensive. I mean, like in California, if you own a new car, they rate it by how much the car weighs and how many horsepower it is, and you're, you're, just your plates might be $400 a year, every year. So the government right now has control of transportation. This is one of the Communist Manifesto blanks, and we have slowly allowed this to happen and not realize what we've done. Very few people even realize this has already been accomplished. The goal was to accomplish all these things with the least amount of waves, and so the fewest possible people understand what's happening. And it has worked. Government ownership of factories and agriculture. And there's been an enormous amount of work in that. The story is told of, you know, there are so many agricultural agents that are regulating these farmers. You know, the farmers are under so many regulations. You know, they have to get their, their agent to tell them, what can I plant this year? You know, is it okay if I plant corn this year? Please, please, I'd like to plant corn. No, there's too much corn on the market. Why don't you plant soybeans this year? They tell them what to do. Two, two government agents were meeting one, one morning, and one of them was crying. And his friend said, what are you crying about? He said, my farmer died. They have about one farmer per agent. There are that many agents out there. <laughs> it's unbelievable what's happening. And more and more farmers are finding it more and more difficult to keep, keep going. 
under all the bureaucratic regulations. So small farmers are going out of business and they're selling out to the huge co-ops and there are gigantic uh, farms being created just like they have in Soviet Union for years. Now in the Soviet Union, the uh, efficiency is, is real bad. If they bring in, if they, if they plant and if they harvest a hundred bushels of corn, only about 10 or 15 bushels makes it to the store. There's so much waste. I mean, this is all a communist system over there. And the, you know, the guy who, who's plowing the field, he doesn't care. He's trying to get in his eight hours. He could care less about that field, okay? If it's a, you know, tractor's low on oil, oh well, tough. You know, it's not my tractor, it's the government's tractor. Private property ownership is the only way things like this can possibly work. So, Communist Manifesto, plank number seven, was government ownership of factories and agriculture. And it's really pretty incredible how far along this has already succeeded in America, where they tell the farmers what they can plant. They now have satellites up in Europe, well, satellites all over the world, but they're spying on farmers to see if they have more cows than they're allowed to have or more sheep than they're allowed to have. They can actually count them from the satellites. Oh, you're cheating. You've got more than you're supposed to have, or you're planting more stuff than you're supposed to have. It's, we have just about lost this battle, folks. Number eight, his goal was government control of labor. Uh, union, the union movement began. Of course, there was a good, good cause for the unions, you know, because the factories were, they were cruel and ruthless and, you know, child labor laws and all sorts of things. So there's a real uh, tough call here of who's right and who's wrong. But in general, the union's mentality is, we're going to tell you what you have to pay us. And the Bible mentality, as I understand it, is if I own this field and I say, I'm going to pay you, you know, six bucks an hour to come pick my corn, and you don't like it, well, then go get a different job. Go plant your own cornfield. <laughs> if you don't like it, go get your own cornfield. But see, the union's mentality is very different. When I was up at General Motors in, uh, in the union, it was so frustrating to me because I was... On an assembly line job, you know, truck, we built uh, middle-sized trucks like they use for dump trucks and school buses and that size, the C60, C70 series at General Motors. The truck comes down the assembly line and we would do our job to the truck and sometimes the, the line would break down. There were people who would deliberately break the line down just because they wanted to go take a coffee break. Guys would take uh, some of the cogs and wheels and gears and stuff and they would toss in a bucket of uh, a coffee can full of nuts and bolts to jam it up, knowing it would take maintenance two hours to fix it just because they wanted to take a break and go get some coffee. Uh, after all, it's not their factory. You know, they're getting paid by the hour regardless. So when the line would break down, I would you know, grab a broom and sweep the floor. The union steward came by and chewed me out royal and said, don't you ever sweep the floor around here. I said, why not? The line's broke. I'm sitting here nothing, doing nothing. I don't like to be idle. I want to do something. He said, by you sweeping that floor, you're taking bread off of somebody else's table. They hire a sweeper to do that. My uh, father-in-law, I was with him uh, um, yesterday up in Arkansas. My son, Kananda, was just with him to this morning and left up there. Uh, he was uh, general foreman at Caterpillar Tractor Company. And the stories he can tell would <laughs> just curl your hair, the stuff they would have to do. They have to hire like five people. If they, if they really need three people to do a job, they have to hire five because absenteeism is so incredible because the union knows, the people know, hey, they can't fire me without real red tape going through. One of the guys that swept the floor at General Motors when I worked there up in uh, Truck and Coach uh, Building 6, he, his name was Red. We called him Red, big, tall, red-headed fella. He only worked three days a week. He would, always, he would call in sick at least two days a week. I mean, for the whole two years I was there. I said, Red, why do you work three days a week? He said, well, I just can't quite make it on what they pay me for two. <laughs> That's his thinking. Well, okay. You can't help a fella like that, you know. <laughs> okay. But government has got an enormous amount of control over the labor market. Number nine, corporate farms, regional planning. And each of these can be developed. We've got a lot more stuff we want to talk about here, but each of these can be talked about in great detail. And there are people who make the, the communist advance in America their whole ministry. Folks, we have just about lost the war to communism. And if you think communism is dead, you are really deceived. <laughs> yeah, then you really have lost out on reality. Number, number 10, free education. This was one of Karl Marx's planks in his Communist Manifesto. Free education for all children in public schools, and watch this carefully, combination of education with industrial production. Karl Marx said the purpose of education is to make people good workers 
good state citizens so they can be productive for the state. How many have ever heard of outcome-based education? School to work. Uh, Goals 2000. There are numerous communist-type programs here in America already in place, already working. Kids go to school and there's going to be a certificate of mastery uh, where you just, you know, they, after a few years, they're going to tell you what you're going to become. Well, you're going to become a farmer. They don't say it's because you're pretty stupid. You know, all you can do is plow, you know, <laughs> plow a field. You know, not that farmers are stupid. Believe me, you got to be really smart if you own your own farm. You got to know just about everything. But uh, <clears throat> this business of what is the purpose of education? The purpose of education in America, in America originally, 200 years ago, you wanted to teach the kid to read as soon as possible so that he could read God's Word, so that he could know what God wanted him to do, so that he could be a good Christian. If he's a good Christian first, then you don't have much problem. He's going to be a good citizen. And the goal was, though, to raise good Christians, a godly people. And if a constitutional republic like America started off with, and both theoretically still have, um, is dependent on the people being self-controlled. The reason you have diapers on a kid is because he does not have any internal controls yet. You have to have external controls. And as a person grows, hopefully they would develop internal controls where they don't need the external control. A population that has internal control that wants God to tell them what to do. Can you imagine if everybody in the world, if just let's take everybody in Florida, if everybody in Florida wanted to do what, what God said, we, they wanted to do right. God says, you know, whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do it with your might. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, you know, gathereth her meat in the summer. Nobody tells the ant what to do. Who's the foreman on the job for the ants? They don't have any. But watch them. There's thousands and thousands of them all working. I sat down, not on, next to an ant pile one time with a notepad and just made notes for an hour as I watched things that I noticed about these ants. They're always time stepping on each other. And nobody griped. I mean, if people could only learn to do that, you know. I saw one ant carrying a piece of a bug. You know, he's a little tiny ant dragging this huge old piece of bug. He's pulling like crazy. Five or six more were wandering by without anybody saying a word. All of a sudden, they grabbed on and started pulling with him. Nobody's telling them to do this. Suppose everybody in Florida was a godly person, wanted to do right, did not want to steal, they were honest and they worked hard. The Protestant work ethic, it's often called. Can you imagine what it would be like living in Florida? You wouldn't need all the rules and regulations, would you? You only need laws, you only need external controls if the people don't have internal control. So one of the goals of communism is to make people wicked, which justifies more external control. Whereas if people are godly, you don't need as much external control. And God, in His wisdom, will generally give a country what they deserve. And I'm afraid America has become so wicked, we're going to get what we deserve, which is probably a totalitarian government. The Bible says, For the transgression of the land, many are the princes thereof. The reason a lot of countries have a lot of bureaucracy is because they're wicked. Basically, they need all these folks telling them what to do. Adolf Hitler said, Let me control the textbooks and I will control the state. United Nations sponsored the World Declaration on Education for All in 1990. They called for the nations of the world to adopt a common education system complete with implementation timetables and recommended curriculum. A world curriculum. Interesting. In our own nation, Goals 2000, School to Work, and the Elementary and Secondary Education Diapers is Profiles of Learning, now before Congress, are totally consistent with the One World Government recommendations of the 1990 UN Declaration. That's what Alan Quist said, uh, Minnesota House Representatives. John uh, Dunfrey in the Humanist magazine said in 1983, the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as proselytizers of a new faith that will replace the rotting corpse of Christianity. There is a real battle going on. And they decided 200 years ago, the place to fight this battle is in the public schools. They figured we would slowly take over the public schools, take over the curriculum, take over the teachers, take over the teachers' colleges. It started with the teachers' colleges. Some people got in key positions in colleges that teach teachers. And then they train them with this humanist thinking. 
and this spreads on then, and it, it has permeated our system. Okay. This is a fellow said, every child who enters school at age five is mentally ill because he comes to school with allegiance toward our elected officials, founding fathers, institutions, government, patriotism, nationalism, sovereignty. All these prove the child is sick because the well child, the well individual is one who has rejected all those things and is what I call the true international child of the future. David Pierce at Harvard University said that. In other words, if you love your country, you're mentally ill. You need help. If you believe in obedience to authority, well, you're sick. You need help, you know. A, a well child has rejected all these things. He's rejected the founding fathers. You know, it's interesting. Go pick up some history textbooks today. Go to the public school, get some history textbooks, and see how much you see about George Washington, Patrick Henry, some of the founding fathers of our country, and see what they say about them. The Gablers have done enormous uh, research on this. Mel Gabler in Longview, Texas. They'll have books and books on this topic. Sometimes textbooks will have a whole page on Marilyn Monroe or Charles Manson and one sentence on George Washington in, the, in a history textbook. <laughs> and they try to make the Founding Fathers look bad every way they can. Social science book from HBJ, Harcourt Brace Jovanovich Corporation said, any child who believes in God is mentally ill. That was used in, in a textbook. Uh, Charles Potter said in the Humanist, uh, Humanism, a New Religion magazine, 1930, Education is the most powerful ally of humanism, and every American public school is a school of humanism. What can the theistic Sunday school, meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children, do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching? Here we see, clear back in 1930, they were going to try to use the schools to teach the kids humanism five days a week, six hours a day. John Patterson said, as a matter of fact, creationism should be discriminated against. No advocate of such propaganda should be trusted to teach science classes or administer science programs anywhere under any circumstances. Moreover, if they are now doing so, they should be dismissed. In other words, fire them if they are creationist. An Iowa professor said, you should fail any student, no matter what the grade records indicate, if the professor discovers the student is a creationist. Furthermore, if the student's department should have uh, the, the student's department should have the rights of retracting grades and possibly even degrees if the student becomes a creationist later. Wow, he's real open-minded about the subject, isn't he? Mr. Yefremov, uh, David's dad. David does our video editing here. Uh, David's dad came to my house a couple years ago and laid his diploma on my desk. He's from Ukraine. He said, "Dr. Hovan, here's my high school diploma." I thought, yeah, you got five kids, two in college, you know, uh, why are you handing me your high school diploma? But I didn't say that to him, you know. He said, you don't understand. When I was in Ukraine, my senior year in high school, he said, I had good grades. Here's my grade card. He showed me. Over there, they give him a one, two, three, four, five. Four and five is, you know, B's and A's. It was all fours and fives. He said, I had good grades. I said, yeah, I see that. He said, um, well, we took a quiz or test before we can graduate. And one of the questions on the test was, do you believe in evolution? I said, no. They refused to let me graduate. I spoke last week in uh, four different churches in Denver, uh, four different Russian churches in Denver, Colorado. And I asked the folks, is it true? And most of them are you know, first generation immigrants straight from Ukraine or Russia. They've been here eight or 10 years, most of them. I said, is it true that in the Russia or Soviet Union, they would not let you graduate from high school if you didn't believe in evolution? They said, oh yeah, that was common. A bunch of them raised their hand. I couldn't believe it. You don't believe in evolution? Sorry, you can't graduate. I guarantee that same type of discrimination is here in America. Now, it's a little more subtle, but there's an awful lot of people. The guy I did the debate with uh, in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, last two weeks ago, he and I debated two evolutionists. He was a PhD candidate, excellent grades all the way through. They refused to let him get his doctorate because he was a creationist. His doctorate in biology kicked him out of the program. I, I, I'd have sued him if it was me. <laughs> I wouldn't have hesitated, okay? That's discrimination. But it happens. And we've got, on, when we get to uh, question answer session, video number seven of my series, we'll show you some of the people that I have met who have been discriminated against, or people who I've talked to or heard about, who just because they were creationists lost their jobs, uh, lost their uh, educational opportunities, lost government grant money. It's incredible. The communists learned years ago that they can get a few rich folks like Rockefeller particularly and some others to use their grant money as a means to advance the cause of communism. See, they will, uh, it's, it's manipulative. 
they will say, oh, we're going to do a study on such and such, and here we will grant you 2000 or 20000 or $100,000 to study this, as long as it goes along with the evolution thinking. What do you think NASA is doing? How much of the NASA budget goes to try to prove life on other planets? Or how much of government funding goes to prove evolution? What if you suggested that we maybe have a, uh, have a uh, grant to try to prove creation? Or to try to prove the biblical account of the flood? It wouldn't go very far at all, would it? Mr. Yefremov was finally sent his diploma 35 years late because he did the translator voiceover on my first edition of my Russian series, sent the tapes over to his home country. The government officials there in his town watched the tapes and says, wow, this is one of our boys from our town. That's Eugene on there. Oh, we got a boy from our town, went to America, became a movie star. Send him his diploma. <laughs> so they sent his diploma 35 years later. This book here, Des Griffin uh, from Oregon, writes prolifically and extremely well-documented stuff on the New World Order. We sell this book. He's got lots of other books. There's his phone number here on the screen. But if you want to get a hold of this one or uh, any of other stuff, if you want to really get into the study of the New World Order and how money ties in. Remember, the Bible says, love of money, root of all evil. Boy, it sure is too. I've decided, like many others, I love my country, but I fear my government. And I think that's the attitude we need to keep. Okay, the communists also have rules for revolution. Now my understanding is that this document of the eight rules for revolution was discovered accidentally in 1919. I don't remember the whole story on this, but a, a, a fellow was shot and killed, and a communist was, and on his, uh, in his pocket was this document, which turns out, had, I, I understand, has been verified from several sources that this is the communist rules for revolution. Now, if you have information on that or find information, please send it to me because I'll put it at the bottom of the screen, you know, where this was from. But I believe it was 1919, someplace in Germany, where a communist spy or soldier or somebody was shot and killed and this document was discovered. Regardless of its authenticity, the concept is certainly correct. Here's what they plan to do. Number one, corrupt the young. Take a look around America, see how things are going. <laughs> Number two, break down old moral virtues. Things are now shown on TV that you would have, you would have uh, stormed the Capitol 20 years ago. I mean, if somebody, uh, Elvis Presley was not allowed on quite a few TV shows because he shook his hips. I mean, that was just taboo. That was just 40 years ago. We've come a long way and it's been downhill, all right? Number three, communist rules revolution, encourage civil disorders and a soft government attitude toward crime. Boy, we got that. Now they've got this three strikes and you're out. Well, how about one strike and you're out? See, the problem with our whole, there's, I don't see, according to scripture, where we, we, should, we shouldn't even have uh, jails and prisons. We shouldn't even have them. How many people, what does it cost to lock a guy up for a year? You know, it's about $60,000, I think, average, somewhere in there, for each prisoner. The system in the Bible is very simple. If somebody steals something, he pays back four times as much. Well, that ought to be a deterrent, right? And for certain crimes, you're executed. That ought to be a deterrent, certainly to him anyway. And that system, is the beauty of it is it's, it's simplicity, it just flat works. Now, some, some have argued, well, look at, what if somebody gets executed for, for a crime, you know, capital punishment, and it turns out later they're innocent? That certainly has happened. The Bible had a very clear system. Nobody gets executed unless there's two witnesses. At the mouth of two or three witnesses. So, if a murder is committed, and there aren't two or three witnesses, you might prove the guy guilty of murder, and there might be some things you can do there, but he can't be executed without witnesses. So that way, that's a safe, a fail-safe method, I think. And uh, Ray Comfort in uh, California, my <coughs> crazy friend, Ray Comfort, has a great, uh, uh, great message on that. You can get a hold of RayComfort.com and get some of his. He's got tremendous messages on. You never met him, have you, Eric? You need to go out there and meet him. Next time you're in Southern California, you got to meet Ray Comfort. The guy's. He's crazy. Anyway, number four, divide the people into hostile groups. Get them to argue about subjects like race or religion, you know. Break them up so they're arguing with each other. This makes them ineffective as a team 
you know, and easier to take over for communism. Number five, get the people's minds off their government. Focus their attention on athletics or sex. You know, in, 19, in 1896, the first Olympics, only 311 athletes participated. How many channels right now, let's say you're flipping through the channels and there are, what, 40 channels on a cable program. How many of those channels are devoted to athletics or sports of some kind? Four, five, six whole channels just for sports? We've gone nuts on sports. Now, there's nothing wrong with sports necessarily, but the sports is a distraction. It's a tool to keep us distracted where we don't think about what's happening in our government. And it's working very well. Here's an advertisement for a 50-inch TV. It said, football is a religion. Build a nice church. And this is, the peop this is the attitude some folks have. Okay, number six, get control of all the media, like CNN, the Communist News Network, with Ted Turner and Hanoi Jane. And praise God, I understand she's been saved. That's great, okay? Uh, thrilled for that. Ted needs it. <coughs> Ted needs it also. But uh, controlling the media, can you imagine if you were told um, 60 or 80 or 100 years ago, your job is to get control of all the newspapers in America? Well, how would you do that? Well, they decided what they could do. These, the communists had a meeting, or the one world minded folks had a meeting, and said, you know, they looked at all the newspapers in America. Everybody was independently owned. And they said, you know, there's 25 key papers. If we can gain control of these 25 papers, we can probably either put the others out of business or cause them to have to merge with us or gradually buy them out, you know, competition. Rockefeller hated competition. <clears throat> he said competition is a sin. That was his attitude toward it. Um, Rockefeller with Standard Oil had, uh, I think, a 90% monopoly of gasoline sales in America before the government made him break it up with the, broke up the monopolies. He studied that in history class. Rockefeller would go into a town and if there were 10 gas stations, he would buy as many as he could. Hopefully, at least six or seven or eight of them. There was always a few, two or three, that just refused. You know, this was my granddaddy's, you know, station, and we're not selling. I don't care what you offer us. We're not selling, okay? So if gas at that time was selling for 20 cents a gallon, Rockefeller would tell all the stations in town, in the ones that he owned in that town, I want you to sell it for uh, 16 cents a gallon. Less than the cost of buying it. They'd say, boss, it costs us 17 cents to buy it. We sell it for 20. We make 3 cents. He'd say, sell it for 16 for the next 3 months. He would lose a lot of money for 3 months. What would happen to the other 3 stations? It's a lot of business. Now he owns every gas station in town. So guess what happens to the price? Up to 23 cents a gallon. You've got to make the money back, you know, that we lost. I mean, that's the type of thing they did. And the government got involved, right or wrong, I don't know, but they did, and tried to break up some of these monopolies. Okay, David Rockefeller of the Rockefeller uh, dynasty, Grandpa J John D. Rockefeller was the one who started this. John D. Rockefeller, if you read the story about John D., it's just, it'll just blow your mind. The guy lived to be 90 years old, but 90-some uh, years old. He, uh, absolutely ruthless, ruthless man uh, in, in, in many ways, in, in, especially in, particularly in business, but... He started this Rockefeller dynasty by selling uh, oil as medicine. Hey, take this, take a spoonful of this crude oil. You know, drill it out of the ground. Drink a spoonful of oil, make you live longer. You know, S snake oil salesman, <laughs> and developed a huge monopoly, a uh, huge amount of money selling oil. That later led right into our modern medical movement. The AMA, the the medical profession. Uh, is tied in strongly with the drug cartels, which is tied in strongly with the Rockefellers. And it, it all goes back to money. Anyway, let's read what he says here. Rockefeller is an international billionaire, a humanist, a CFR kingpin. That's the Council of Foreign Relations, okay, the kingpin. He's a founder of the Trilateral Commission, a world order godfather, and in all probability, the high school graduate voted most likely to be hanged for treason. He voiced his praise of the controlled U.S. media for keeping their oath not to divulge the globalist plans to the public. Speaking to his fellow conspirators at a meeting in 1991 in Baden, Germany, one of the famous Bilderberger meetings. How many have ever heard of the Bilderbergers before? Okay. This is a group of folks, they meet once a year to make, lay plans for how can we gain control of, more control of the world. Rockefeller said, 
We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. He went on to explain, it would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government. The supranatural means above national, supranational, sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national autodeterminism practiced in past centuries. What he says here is, we'd be better off with a world government with bankers, like himself, <coughs> in charge, instead of every nation running their own, you know, their, own, their own people. His mentality was, we need a one world government. It's always been that way, and they work toward that very hard. And Rockefeller and their clan have been one of the primary people involved in aiding communism. They kept communism alive because you've got, you got to have an enemy to justify all this big arms race we got going on here. Pretty soon people get sick and tired of paying all this money for you know, missiles and submarines and aircraft carriers when, uh, for what, you know? There's no enemy. Many wars could not have been fought if we hadn't gone off, if it weren't for going off the gold standard. During the Civil War, when they're on the gold standard, you've got to have gold, you just can't buy ammo otherwise. Gold and silver, you've got to have real money. Well, if all you've got to do is crank up the printing press and print more paper money, well, that's simple to do. There's an awful lot of tragedy in the world. A lot of people died in wars that could not have been fought were it not for this love of money stuff we talked about earlier. Okay, here's what some of the um, news media anchors have said, like uh, Richard Cohen, senior producer of CBS Political News. He said, we're going to impose our agenda on the coverage by dealing with the issues and subjects we choose to deal with. Let me stop right there. Anytime you see something in the news for quite a while that's really kind of stupid, like the O.J. Simpson thing, almost a year of all kinds of coverage on O.J. Simpson, Anytime you see that, antennas ought to go up and you ought to think, okay, what are they trying to cover up? What they were covering up in that case was Bill Clinton's trying to give China most favored nation status and trying to give a Los Angeles port to China. They were going to allow the communist Chinese to have some property in Los Angeles. Well, guess what they would do? They would bring in drugs by the boatload. Uh, you just, so many folks that have whole ministries dealing with what's happening, you know, United Nations, and uh, Chuck Baldwin does a great job on that. You heard me on his program the other day, he said, uh, he can give you lots more information on this. Okay, here's president of CBS News, Richard Salant, former president. He said, our job is to give people not what they want, but what we decide they ought to have. Manage the news for them, just like in the Soviet Union. The New York Times is deliberately pitched to the liberal, that's socialist, point of view. New York Times, certainly a liberal paper. News reporters are certainly liberal and left of center, Walter Cronkite said. He should know, he's one of them. Barbara Walters said, the news media in general are liberals, socialists. Number seven, rules for revolution, destroy people's faith in their leaders. Wasn't hard to do here for the last 10 years, was it? Uh, Joseph Stalin is, this is attributed to him, I can't prove that he said this, but many people say that's all right. Okay. He said, those who cast the votes decide nothing. Those who count the votes decide everything. A man spoke here in Pensacola at the uh, Shoney's Inn out uh, Highway 10, Interstate 10, you know, and by Shoney's Restaurant. He spoke uh, several years ago on um, voter fraud. I went out to hear him speak. He said that they had gone when during the uh, primary when Pat Buchanan was running uh, to be presidential candidate. They suspected voter fraud because every place the votes were hand counted, Buchanan won. If the computer counted them, Bob Dole won. So he said that they went to some place where they have these voting machines after the primary's over, Bob Dole won, you know, and then lost the presidential race. They went to this place and they got 10 ballots and marked them all, Pat Buchanan, Pat Buchanan, Pat Buchanan, fed them into the machine, six of them registered for Bob Dole. Hmm. Now, somebody who has no morals, like Bill Clinton, 
they're not above this. Figure out some way to, to get into the voting system and control it. And all the people think, well, I voted for the right guy. Yeah, but your vote didn't do anything. So really, all you need is a few people in key places who can control who's counting the votes or how they're counted. Or better yet, what if you just got to the people in Mexico that create the voting software that counts the votes? That the, you know, computer's going to count it? Well, computers, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Suppose you could write the software in such a way that all you had to do was give it a secret code and it would make the election come out the way you wanted it. Many people think that is what's happened. That has been what has happened here in America. Number eight, cause the registration of all firearms. You want to control a country, you have to have people unarmed. You know, all the lions got together for a conference one day and voted that, you know, certain animals have horns that are just too dangerous. They should not be allowed to have horns that are quite that dangerous. We should trim those horns way back and round them off and maybe put some safety tips on the end. Wouldn't the lions all vote for a bill like that? Sure. <laughs> of course they would. What's happening is we've got a bunch of people who want a one world government. They're meeting trying to put rules and regulations on gun control. And their motive is make us unable to defend ourselves. We'll talk a little, about, a little bit more about gun control right after a quick break here and show you the, uh, the Hovind attitude toward gun control coming up soon. Thank you. All right, let's talk about gun control. It is attributed to Vladimir Lenin that he said, one person with a gun can control 100 people without one. All you got to do is look at any concentration camp or prison, and you see this is exactly correct. Picture this scenario. You're in the bank waiting to cash a check or something. A guy walks in with a gun and says, everybody lay on the floor. Well, everybody lays on the floor. He has the gun. Now, picture this scenario. Everybody in the bank has a gun. Everybody's carrying a concealed weapon. They don't want to hurt anybody. They just want to protect themselves just in case, so they're all carrying a concealed weapon, like I do most of the time. Somebody walks into the bank, says, everybody lay on the floor. So 100 people pull out their gun. Uh, Sir, you lay on the floor. Right? That's all it takes. Gun control is not about guns, it's about control. Lenin called for disarming the people. Stalin called for gun control. Hitler called for gun control. See, gun control goes back to the basic idea of, I have power over you. I have the gun, you don't. You do what I say, I am in control, which goes back to Satan's basic idea of, hey, ye shall be as gods. And whoever has the power, has the control, they feel like they are God in that situation. And the American government has done a wonderful job of getting bigger and better weapons, and we can certainly control during wartime. We dominate. And you guys are in the military, and I think our, our military system is wonderful. It's great. But what if the wrong people get in charge of it? Then we're going to dominate who? <laughs> who gets dominated? You know? Us. Yeah. It's going to be used on us. Um, there's a website about this, members.localnet.com uh, dash Bob G slash IFA6, if you want to get more information on that. Bob, Don Boy is a good friend of mine, was a uh, member of Indiana House Representatives, lives in Ringgold, Georgia, near Chattanooga, Tennessee. He uh, travels and speaks on creation and a uh, uh, really, really smart fella. He said, gun control is not about guns, but it's about control. He said, you might be a liberal if you don't trust honest Americans with automatic weapons, but you do trust the federal government with them. He said, you might be a liberal if you think guns are the cause of crime, but you don't think matches are the cause of arson. Think about that. You might be a liberal if you think the death penalty is government-sanctioned killing, but you don't think a prison sentence is government-sanctioned kidnapping. <laughs> that is a good one. You guys are a thinker. I love these, the way he thinks. You know, I say, wow, why didn't I think of that? You know? A Second Amendment to the Constitution was very clear. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So if Congress passes a law that bans people from owning machine guns, that law is null and void. It is a violation of the Second Amendment. A law is null and void from the moment it is passed. 
if it violates the Constitution. So you don't have to wait until it's proven unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional right away. You cannot violate the Constitution. So no matter what laws they pass, it doesn't matter because the Constitution takes precedence over all of this. The purpose of the Second Amendment was not so we can go duck hunting. It's so we can protect ourselves from our own government if need be. I heard a lady, I saw the videotape of a lady testifying before Congress. They were debating about gun control. She sat there in front of all these guys, you know, these uh, senators who wanted gun control. And she said, uh, I was in the restaurant in Texas when the man came in uh, shooting people. Was that Luby's restaurant? And, yeah. She said, I was in there with my mom and dad. They were having their 40th anniversary. Dad had taken mom out for 40th anniversary dinner. The guy came in, began shooting people, shot my father in the head. He was laying there dying, and my mom was holding him in her hands, and the guy's still going around shooting people. And I said, Mom, he's not looking. Let's get out of here. And we had a chance to escape. So I grabbed Mom, pulled on her, and said, Let's go, Mom. And she said, I ran out the door. I turned around and realized Mom hadn't come with me. The gunman went over, shot my mom point blank in the head, and killed her. She said, I'm not mad at the guns. She said, and you guys are debating on gun control. Please do not vote for any gun control. We don't need gun control. We need criminal control. She said, we need guns in America. The purpose of the Second Amendment was so that we can protect ourselves from, from you guys. And she pointed right to them. I thought, yay, somebody finally figured out why we have the Second Amendment. The purpose of the Second Amendment is the last defense if the government goes bad. The Founding Fathers were sharp. They had just come out under the rule of King George. And the only way to keep government in line is for government to fear the people. See, if the people fear their government, you now have tyranny. If the government fears the people, you can have freedom. The government ought to be afraid to pass laws and afraid to do things that are unconstitutional because there's too many patriots out there that love their country and love their freedom. Many animals that eat grass have big horns. What do you need horns for when you're eating grass? Does that help meet the grass? No. All he wants to do is eat the grass, right? But the lion keeps jumping on his back. He doesn't have the horns to help him eat the grass. He has the horns to keep the lion off his back so that he can just eat the grass. I don't have, we got, we've always had guns around our house, lots of them, and they're always loaded. I didn't tell my kids, pretend like it's loaded. It was loaded. <laughs> it is. An unloaded gun is just a club. And when I pick it up, if I got to shoot it, I want to be ready to shoot it. <laughs> I don't want to say, hold on, sir, I got to find my bullets. You know, like Barney, you know, where's my bullet? Man, they're in it. They're ready to fire. Pick it up, flip the safety off, and hit the trigger. And go, you know. And there's guns everywhere. And my kids have grown up with that, and they started shooting when they were three years old. You know, I wanted to be good shots. They knew real well, don't touch that gun or daddy's going to spank you, and you won't forget that one for a long time. I tell you when you can touch the gun, okay? Um, I don't want to shoot anybody. Honestly, I don't. Never have. Hope I never have to. I have guns because there are some people that want to come, you know, hurt my family. I just want to protect my family, that's all. I'm like the bull. I don't want to hurt anybody. I just want to eat the grass. But if you jump on my back, <laughs> you're going to get it. Period. I think that's the right and godly attitude. As I understand scripture, there are two kinds of wars, basically. There are wars of aggression. Where you're trying to take over somebody else's property. That's wrong. Then there are wars where you just have to defend yourself because somebody else is having a war of aggression against you. Now, if you are the aggressor trying to take somebody else's land, you're wrong, okay? You ought to be, they ought to shoot you. <laughs> they have a right to shoot you. It's called self-defense. But if somebody's coming to take away my property or take, you know, harm my wife or my children, I have a right to defend myself. That's a universal common sense law, the right to self-defense. And that's, that's what guns are about. And gun control is going to be slow, gradual, choking down where you no longer have the ability to defend yourself. The Lions held a conference to outlaw horns on animals. They said it was dangerous to allow these untrained animals to have such dangerous weapons. 
they cited examples where some animals had been accidentally harmed by horns. We need to outlaw horns on the animals. Well, why would the lions hold a conference like that, do you think? <laughs> Obviously, they have an ulterior motive, don't they? Remember when the uh, kids got shot in Colorado? Right away, the liberal media jumped on the gun control issue, didn't they? Those kids broke 18 gun laws breaking into that school or going into that school shooting everybody. They violated 18 gun laws. Do you think two more gun laws would have helped? How about 10 more? Maybe 20 more? They don't care. Criminals don't care about the laws you pass. The purpose of those laws is, is only to get the honest citizens to become criminals by breaking those laws. Liberal media jumped on gun control. You know, maybe the real issue is, should we have public schools? Should we teach the kids evolution? That's what caused that gun control thing, or caused the Columbine shooting. Those two kids were strong believers in evolution. They did the shooting on Adolf Hitler's birthday. We'll get into more on Hitler in a little bit. They shot Isaiah Scholes just because he was black. They shot Cassie just because she believed in God. Eric's t-shirt said, natural selection. They spoke German to each other in the hallway. Nothing wrong with German, expecting Kleine Bisch and Deutsch, but she, it was, this was a evolution. Evolution was the foundation philosophy behind what happened at Columbine High School. I'm convinced of that. See, blaming guns for Columbine is like blaming spoons for Rosie O'Donnell being fat. It is not the spoon's fault. Okay? <laughs> and it's not the gun's fault that those kids got shot. It's the person's fault. Okay? <laughs> I love that. Somebody sent me that picture of back of a van. I'm glad driving around with that on there. That's so good. I thought, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> you know? Maybe the real issue is, shouldn't cer should certain criminals be publicly executed? If executions were swift and public, in the Bible it's a pretty neat system. The offended person gets to be involved. You throw the first stone. I mean, if somebody murdered your wife or husband or kids, there's, there's a normal, natural anger that gets inside of people. That's normal. I'm angry. Look what they did to me. And the, the proper godly response, the release of that, God knows, what, He made people, He knows what we're built like. He did the whole thing, okay? It gives a relief, a, re, a, a release of this tension when you can see that person who did that harm to your family executed. Should you choose to be involved in it? I want to flip the switch? Okay. I want to throw the first stone. This gets the anger out. Maybe you saw the movie Forrest Gump, you know, where the lady at the end of the movie, she's throwing rocks at that house, you know, that her dad molested her in. And old Forrest said, sometimes there just aren't enough rocks, you know. There's just something in people that they just want to, to get closure. And this, cause, this causes closure. How many people right now tonight, they, they, they were harmed or someone in their family was harmed. The person who harmed them is sitting in jail. That person tonight is a nervous wreck, thinking that person in jail might escape, right? How many women have been raped? The guy who raped them is in prison, scheduled for relief, release today. I sat yesterday and had dinner with three Arkansas representatives, and they were talking about, you know, this... Uh, they're talking about, uh, one of the guys introduced a law to make rape a capital offense where you get executed. Execute people for rape. And one of the other congressmen says, well, that didn't take away their life. He said, yeah, it did. That did take away their life. <laughs> think about it. Yes, it does. Okay, maybe we should think about, uh, should law, all law-abiding citizens be required to carry guns to protect themselves? Suppose every teacher in Columbine High School was required to be armed and the kids all knew it. Do you think they would have gone down the hall shooting everybody? No. One of the auto parts places, it wasn't AutoZone or DAPS or one of those, I forget, national chains, decided that they're going to have an, uh, signs put on all their doors, no guns allowed. No guns allowed on these premises. What does that sign say to a criminal? That says, rob me, <laughs> doesn't it? Uh, duh, you don't need to be a genius to figure it out. 
And so the National Rifle Association, NRA, or else the Gun Owners of America, which is even a more uh, uh, conservative, you know, properly uh, thought out organization than National NRA, Gun Owners of America, uh, GOA. I'm not a member of either group. I, I love what they do. I'm just not a member of any groups except my church. That's all I got time for. But um, they wrote to them and said, we're going to tell all of our people not to buy at your store. Gun owners are uh, people, you know, they don't, aren't the ones committing the crimes. They, they're the ones wanting to defend themselves. They just want to eat the grass. They just have the horns just in case, you know. <laughs> That's all. Hitler is reported to have said, now I've taken some criticism over this quote because some people say, I searched Hitler's writings and couldn't find this. I cannot prove that he said this, okay? I've tried desperately to find the evidence of this. I've had some people tell me, oh yes, it's absolutely true, Hitler said that. Other people said, well, it hasn't been proven yet. Whether the quote is legitimate or not, I don't know. The, the, the philosophy certainly is, okay? It is reported that Hitler said in 1935, this year we'll go down in history. For the first time, a civilized nation had full gun registration. Our streets safer, will be safer, our police more efficient, <laughs> boy were they, and the world will follow our lead into the future. 1935. Janet Reno said, gun registration is not enough. She said, waiting periods are only a step. Registration is only a step. The prohibition of private firearms is the goal. Howard Metzenbaum, former senator from Ohio, said, what good does it do to ban some guns? All guns should be banned. Little Howard gets robbed a few times. He'll, he'll change his tune, right? <laughs> Sarah Brady, you've heard of the Brady Bill? Sarah Brady said, our task of creating a totally socialist America can only succeed when those who would resist have been totally disarmed. You have to disarm your enemy. What's the first thing you do in war? You conquer somebody, you beat them, everybody surrenders. Take away their guns. Desert storm. Thousands of Iraqis surrendered. Did they let them keep their weapons? No. <laughs> You got a couple of Marines with machine guns can guard a couple of thousand Iraqis that are unarmed. Right? Um, Bill Clinton, former President of the United States of America, people say, oh, why did you mis misspell it on there? Oh no, it's not misspelled. <laughs> He's a communist through and through, okay? Clinton's philosophy is certainly communistic. Hillary's worse. Clinton said, and we should, then every community in the country should, could start doing major weapons sweeps and then destroying the weapons, not selling them. The idea is to destroy the weapons. Australia had gun control. In the first 12 months after Australian gun owners surrendered their guns, this was a couple years ago, they surrendered 640,000 personal firearms. They were destroyed. Cost the government $500 million to destroy the guns in Australia. Homicides nationwide went up 3.2% after gun control. Assaults are up 8%. Armed robberies are up 44%. Well, I thought they took away the guns. How can you have armed robberies? Well, duh. You think the criminals are going to surrender their guns? <laughs> are you dumb in any other area? Uh, in the state of Victoria, homicides with firearms went up 300%. Figures over the previous 25 years show a steady decrease in armed robbery with firearms. There's been a dramatic increase in break-ins and assaults of the elderly since they banned the guns. What's the average criminal thinking? Let's see, nobody has guns anymore. Everybody's an easy target, right? In 1911, Turkey established gun control. For the next six years, one and a half million Armenians, unable to defend themselves, were rounded up and exterminated, killed. 1929, Soviet Union established gun control. Over the next 30 years, 20 million dissidents, unable to defend themselves, were rounded up and exterminated. 20 million people. Do you know how many that is? Jews are prohibited from carrying firearms and ammunition according to a Nazi gun control decree in 1938. Germany established gun control in 1938. They had gun registration first. Now gun control. They decide who gets them. 1939 to 1945, 13 million Jews and others were unable to defend themselves and were rounded up and exterminated. Brian works in our ministry. He can give you lots of details on what happened here, but when the Warsaw Ghetto decided, we're just going to, they're killing us, let's go fight them. They only had like five guns. Most of the Jews had never touched a gun, had no idea how to use one. Only a few people even knew how to use them. They put up a horrendous fight against the Nazis, I mean, in an extremely lousy situation. 
they're going to get killed anyway. Go down fighting. Okay. China established gun control in 1935, and for the next few years, 20 million political dissidents, dissidents unable to defend themselves were rounded up and exterminated. Guatemala established gun control in 1964. Over the next 16 years, 100,000 Mayan Indians unable to defend themselves were rounded up and exterminated. Uganda established gun control in 1970. For the next eight years, 300,000 Christians unable to defend themselves were rounded up and exterminated. Cambodia established gun control in 1956. 1975 to 77, one million educated people unable to defend themselves were rounded up and exterminated. Defenseless people around, rounded up and exterminated in the 20th century because of gun control, 56 million. Next time someone talks in favor of gun control, ask them, who do you want to round up and exterminate? With guns, we are citizens. Without guns, we are subjects. Our founding fathers were sharp. They said, look, you have to allow people to defend themselves. There are many people in our government who have a communist philosophy, whether they know it or not. They might not even know it. But they do have a communist philosophy which leads right to this idea, you know, we really ought to take away everybody's guns. Only the UN should have guns because we can trust them. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. The plan is very simple. The communists have used this for years. You create a crisis and then you bring in your solution. Hitler blew up the government building, the Reichstag. He blew it up himself, or had his people blow it up. And then he said, wow, look at this, terrorists, that means we need more gun control. Everything that happened at Waco and at Oklahoma City was all part of the same thing. It was purposely done to cause people to panic and give up their rights and establish more gun control. Long stories can be told about that, okay? Uh, communist definition of peace is simply the absence of resistance. When everybody quits fighting, then we have peace. Surrender your guns and we'll be fine. Karl Marx, the father of communism, wanted to dedicate his book to Charles Darwin. He sent a copy of his book, Das Kapital, to Charles Darwin, and on the front page he wrote, dedicated to Charles Darwin from a sincere admirer, Karl Marx, 1873. Karl Marx knew full well communism couldn't survive without evolution as a philosophical base. I read somewhere, I don't remember, I think it's in The Long War Against God. Karl Marx, uh, when he read Darwin's book, he wrote a letter to Engels, who supplied all of his money, because Marx was a loser, never worked a day in his life. He said, Engels, I just read this book by Darwin. This is perfect to justify our theories of communism. Well, all through his speeches, Karl Marx referred to evolution. Notice this. Marx often bowled over opposition with mountain-moving declarations of superconfidence. Historical evolution is on your side, he shouted to followers. Capitalism, in, brought into being by the laws of historical evolution, will be destroyed by those same laws. All you got to do is read through Karl Marx's stuff and you'll see him referring to evolution over and over again. This was the philosophy. Comrade Stalin, communist, entered school. He went, went to a Christian school as a child. While still a pupil at the ecclesiastical school, Comrade Stalin developed a critical mind and revolutionary sentiments. He began to read Darwin and became an atheist. Now, Joseph Stalin read that book. That changed his life forever. Here he is going to a Christian school, became a communist, became a revolutionary, became an evolutionist. Missionaries have said, when they work in a country like China, when the, when the communists came in and took over China, missionaries were all over China. They reported, the first thing the communists came in to the villages and did was start teaching the kids evolution. They didn't teach them communism, taught them evolution first. You've got to have evolution first, and then you can teach them about communism. First, you've got to take away God, then put man in his place. Joseph Stalin killed between 60 and 100 million of his own people. You ought to read any of the books by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I read the book uh, Gulag Archipelago, Archipelago Gulag. Gulag Archipelago. It's like 900 and some pages. Somebody said, Brother Hovind, I want you to read this book. It's great. I thought, yeah, right. I get, you know, I read two books a week as it is, and I, I'm swamped. I don't have any more time. I said, okay, I'll just read a few pages. I couldn't put it down. <laughs> 900 pages just. This guy lived in the concentration camps. He was there for 15 years. 
He now, I think, is still alive, isn't he, in Vermont? He's getting pretty old. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn has written extensively about communism, life under Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin's daughter became a Christian. Interesting. When the communists attacked G Poland during World War II, see, Germany and Russia had an agreement that they wouldn't fight. Hitler had no plans of keeping that agreement because he thought this, the Slavic people were half Aryan, half ape. We'll show you in a minute about that. But, uh, when they attacked Poland, the Polish army put up an incredible, ferocious resistance, but they were just outnumbered and outgunned. It was just absolutely no chance of winning. But like uh, Churchill said, sometimes it's better to fight when there's no chance of winning than to be slaves. It's better to see it coming a few years ahead of time, you know, but hey, if it's too late, <laughs> go down with the fight, okay? Suppose every Jew that was being captured to take off to the concentration camps had put up a fight and killed one Nazi or tried to kill one Nazi. I just suppose, you know, maybe the outcome would have been a little different. They ended up slaughtering these uh, Polish uh, people and they captured thousands and thousands of, ca of, of uh, prisoners. They had 14,700 prisoners at one place, the officers in the Polish army. They said to Stalin, what should we do with them? We got all these 14,700 Polish officers. He said, execute them. They're Poles. They're inferior species. The Russians finally admitted this in 1993, but they did it clear back in 1942 or 41, 42. They took all these prisoners, Polish officers, put hoods over their heads, tied their hands behind their back, and then jerked them up as hard as they could and wrapped the rope around the hood. So the harder you pull down, the more you choke yourself. Took them out to the woods, Katyn Forest, and shot them in the back of the head. 14,700 officers. You say, oh, that's terrible. What about the Geneva Convention? The Geneva Convention says you can't do that. You've got to treat your prisoners a certain way. Well, duh. If you're a communist, there's no God. What, what motivation would you have to keep your word on a convention? If a lion makes a treaty with a lamb, should the lamb get excited? Hey, Mr. Lion, you promised you wouldn't hurt me. I got this piece of paper right here. <laughs> Well, wait till the lion gets hungry and see how much that paper does, okay? <laughs> and here we got these idiots in our government making treaties with the communists, you know, SALT treaties and, you know, strategic arms limitation talks and stuff like that. Absolutely dumb. People have said, well, the communists, you know, they're hurting over there. The economy's bad. You know, we got we to gotta support their economy. Okay, well, let's buy their tanks and their battleships at 10 cents on the dollar. You got paid 40 million for that? We'll give you 4 million. Well, forget it, it's worth 40 million. Well, that's okay, when you get hungry, come see us. You can't eat that tank, you know. <laughs> Paul Pot, dictator in Cambodia, executed one third of his entire population. The movie Killing Fields is about this. It's a bad movie, but it, it true, truly depicts what happened. People were killed just because they wore glasses. Because he figured, oh, you wear glasses? You must know how to read. You're educated. <laughs> That's what communism did to Cambodia. The guy that works at Camera America, a, couple, a year ago, and I was, I was in there one time, he may not still work there. I said, hey, he just had a slight accent. I said, where are you from? He said, uh, Cambodia. I said, really? How'd you get to America? He said, I barely escaped. He said, everybody in my family was killed. Lost my mother, my father, my brothers, my sisters, my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents. I'm the only survivor here in Pensacola, working at Camera America. Uh, 1975 to 1979, the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, Paul Pot was the leader, they began executing people. Anybody that opposed him in any way. By the way, Paul Pot is still on the loose, last I heard. Still setting landmines and bombs all over the area, blowing up kids as they walk through the woods killed a third of the entire population. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records under genocide. Mass genocide. The communists took over China in 1949 with American help, by the way. The capitalists helped the communists take over China. Long story behind that. They began executing Christians because Christians don't fit in well with New World Order type governments. They killed 15,000 a month. 60 million 
Chinese were killed under, by their own government. And if, if there's a, a takeover in America, you'll see the same type of slaughter here of American citizens by the American government. And there's all sorts of people who have been doing research on this about the concentration camps that are already being built and the plans already being laid at the Amtrak station in Indianapolis where they re remodeled that to be a uh, transportation hub to bring the people in when they you know, don't go along with the system. We'll cover more on that next week. We'll take up more about communism and how it ties in with Nazism and Adolf Hitler and his book Mein Kampf. You want to read something interesting, you ought to read Hitler's book, what he wrote about uh, his philosophy of life. We'll see how that affected things starting next week. Communism, evolution, Nazism, it all ties together, folks. It's all rejecting God. Next, see you next week.